and gentlemen. Let's rock and roll. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Live Free Now show, bringing you the news, views, tips, and tools you can use to live a free and prosperous life. I am your host, John Bush, and we are really excited today to be joined by Patrick Friedman of Pronomos Capital. He is going to be joining us for the Land Summit as well, the Excellent Build Land Summit. Uh, many of you are familiar, we are going to be helping folks to exit the cities, to buy land, build community in the country, but it's also about how can we explore settlements and living together in community in a new way that isn't the same old hierarchy and control and uh, top-down narrative. Of course, uh, I strongly believe that the more free we are, the more independent we are of all these legacy systems, which are essentially like crippling. People say things are failing or like we're experiencing the failure of all these systems, but really it's the old systems that are failing. And sometimes that has to happen in order to make way for the new system. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring our special guest. If you guys want to learn more about the Land Summit, by the way, exitandbuildlandsummit.com, exitandbuildlandsummit.com. It's taking place May 17th through the 19th, May 17th through the 19th. And I think Patry and the work that he's doing is really going to complement uh, what we're what we're doing there because it's like big picture stuff, and that always gets me excited. So, uh, Patry, how are you? Doing great. <laughs> My pronouns are "it's a psyop." I love that. <laughs> love <Yeah>. that. <laughs> so, um, why don't you first introduce us, uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Maybe there's some folks that aren't familiar with your work. I understand that you've been in the game for quite some time, so. Uh, excited to uh, to learn more sure i guess um i'm kind of like the startup countries guy for more than 20 years now i've been really interested in how we can start new countries to experiment with different social political and legal systems um you know i come from a tech background i was at google for 10 years and you know a lot of how i think about government is like governments are businesses and like the global governance industry and it's a really shitty industry that treats its customers really poorly. I think one reason is that we don't have, like, we don't have enough startups, right? There's not like ways of making new societies that do things better and actually have like legal autonomy. Um, and we live in a time when the old systems, like you said, are, are, are very much failing. And so, you know, there's just all these different people out there who are saying, hey, let's rebuild part of our civilization you know, whether that's education or healthcare or a city without plastics, um, you know, or the work that I do. And my particular focus within that area is like communities that actually get to write their own laws. That's what, you know, that's what gets me excited. And so I worked for about 10 years at the Seasteading Institute, which I started, which was trying to do this on the ocean. Because uh, back then in the 2000s, countries were not at all willing to work with us um, and do things on land. And that changed in 2011 with Honduras. And so for the last 10 years or so, I've been focused on working with countries to create these experimental cities on land. So cities that write their own laws, basically. Awesome. So a lot of what we're doing with the Excellent Build Land Summit, we're talking about people building intentional communities, eco villages. For example, we have a 10 acre property with two community members. We're gonna be adding a couple more. But you're talking about like big picture, like let's rethink how cities work entirely, how they're governed. Um, that's pretty cool, pretty exciting. You've been a libertarian for quite some time now, and I know that your father is David Friedman, so you got it, got it in your blood. Were you exposed to those ideas early, and and did that kind of have an influence on you finally thinking like, well, how are we actually going to build this? Yeah, definitely. Um, although I will say, I was. I think I'm kind of like an intuitive libertarian. I was arguing with kids in middle school about free speech and drug legalization <laughs> and stuff before I even knew any of the details of my family's political positions. Um, <laughs> you know, since I, I, I grew up with my mom and um, hadn't started talking politics with, with my dad yet. Um, but I would say that in the early 2000s when I got curious about like, why is there not a country for me, right? Like a country that doesn't lock people up for what plants they eat and also like doesn't go do stupid wars and is like maybe run as well as like the average store in the mall like why doesn't that exist one of the places that uh, i learned a lot from on the theory side was was my dad's book law's order about the economic analysis of law and machinery of freedom and 
machinery of freedom is this, um, you know, it's a proposal for an alternate way to generate laws. There's some good economic arguments why it might produce better laws, laws which kind of do more net good compared to democracy. And, you know, with the internet now, there's, I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands, maybe even, maybe there's a million people who would want to try this anarcho-capitalism, which is like the worst branding. People generally either hate anarchism or <laughs> capitalism, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people who would want to try it, but there's no way to try it. And so, you know, it's like you might think, well, the prob the reason we don't have great functioning political systems is that nobody has like come up with a good one yet. But my dad came up with a good one. And I think it's like really interesting, worth exploring. And so it was that helped make it clear to me that that was not the bottleneck. The bottleneck was getting to actually put systems into practice to build them in the real world and see how they worked. Love that. So can you talk a bit, like, just to get philosophical and economic, I guess, about the role that competition plays in innovating and just helping to make human lives better? And, of course, there's a oftentimes a vacuum of competition when it comes to government and their monopolies. Yeah, I mean, that's fundamental to my whole philosophy is this idea of, of competitive governance that in any industry, having healthy competition with you know, a bunch of startups and different firms serving different customer segments and trying out new things. That's how we get technological progress. You know, that's how we get our, our cars and our phones getting better every year. But in government, there's a couple of, of issues that block this. One is the really high customer lock in. So it's hard to change your country. Mm -hmm. Like it's a lot of work. You leave your friends, you know, in the old days, you left your job. Uh, and the harder it is for customers to switch firms, then obviously the worse the customers will be treated, right? If you can't leave, hmm. then, you know, it's essentially a monopoly. A monopoly is not a zero to one black or white thing. You can just think of it as being like, what is the cost of switching? And like a pure monopoly is like, there's no one to switch to. So, you know, the cost of switching is, is everything versus perfect competition. It's like nothing. And as you go in between, as things get more and more monopolistic because it's harder and harder to switch, then of course they do a worse job because they can do a worse job and still keep their customers. And then the other issue is what we'd call the barrier to entry, which is like, how hard is it to make a new company to enter an industry, hmm. right? And it's super, super hard for government, right? I can make a new <laughs> web app like with my laptop. Mm -hmm. How do you make a new country? Like, like even winning an election is not enough for what I'm talking. I'm talking about actually trying out like a new legal system, a new political system. So that's it's so hard that like we don't even there's no recognized way to become a new country. There's no procedure. So what I love about this is that it, it kind of takes a lot of the I guess as I become older and really interested in mental health, I, I tend to see the idea that like everyone should see things my way. My idea of right and wrong is what's right. And society should enact my idea of right and ban my idea of wrong. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't do it, it's committing this horrible sin. Like, I think all that's bad for our mental health. And instead, we can take a step back and just feel like, hey, this is an industry. Like, we're the customers, the citizens. We, like, move to towns and states and countries hoping to get a good deal for a good price. Um, and this industry works like shit because it's really hard to switch firms. And it's almost impossible to start a new company. And just those facts alone, that lack of competition, means that it's going to do a, a, a crappy job. And it takes us out of complaining and into building like out of just being like, oh, if I convince other people to see right and wrong the same as me, or I convince those politicians to enact what's right, takes us out of that headspace and into like, okay, what can we build? How can we make it easier to switch? How can we break down this problem into solutions? I love it. And, you know, in some ways too, it actually might, even though it's obviously crazy challenges, and I want to get into some of the examples of, of the work that y'all have done, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, but it might almost be easier to pursue this route than to convince 50% plus one of the voting public to start experimenting with the genuinely free society, you know? So um, so it's pretty cool, the work that you guys are doing, like um, really important. I remember there was this guy named Rich Paul. He was up in the Free State Project. 
and he got in a lot of trouble as part of this Crypto Six crew. These guys that got in trouble for selling Bitcoin without a, a license um, and without scanning all their driver's license KYC check. Anyway, he he referred to this must have been way back in the day at Pork Fest, like 15 years ago. And he's an anarcho-capitalist. And I was like, how would you define anarcho-capitalism for folks that don't understand it? And he said, think about anarcho-capitalism like a computer's operating system where it's just like default freedom. You can have a, you can do a society what you, however you would like for it to be built. And then you have these programs, and the programs are like the different countries or the competing governance models. So some mm. person could have a socialist country over here. We could have a voluntarist over here, a more uh, horizontal freed markets, so to speak, over here. Um, is that a good analysis of it, you think? It's just like anarcho-capitalism gives you the freedom to experiment in whatever way, even if you don't have a capitalist system? Yeah, and I mean, certainly it's a description of, of how I think things should be. Like, I, I fundamentally believe that people should be able to come together and create communities and govern themselves. And, you know, whatever system they agree to, they should get to try. Uh, it's, you know, it's not on us to tell them what will or won't work. And so that's what I'm trying to create is a world where people are free to do that. Excellent. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So um, let's talk about some of the early work that y'all have done in this space. You mentioned Honduras. Uh, what, what does it actually look like to strike up a conversation with a government's leader? And then I know there's all sorts of politics at play. Obviously, you have to communicate with them in a way that's that where it's clear that this is going to be in your interest because you think that most politicians would be opposed to giving up power or experimenting with any system that may take away their ability to rule others or to enrich themselves, which is what motivates many politicians. So what were the early conversations like in order to do that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to answer there. I mean, one thing is it, it yeah, it is a, a, a real trip to be talking to heads of state when I started out on Yahoo Group's mailing lists, you know, and like, 2002 maybe um so that's really exciting as far as honduras one really amazing thing about that program is that it was all generated by the hondurans hmm. like it was not something where you know people in the movement went and tried to convince the country which is what happens in the vast majority of cases that's how it works but not in honduras i you know they the the group of politicians that um that won the election in 2009 they had some like Western university economics trained people. Uh, and I think they, they probably got the idea from the Paul Romer Ted talk, although, you know, he got some really important things, right. And some important things wrong. And they just started creating the program themselves and bringing in international experts. I found out about it in 2011 after they passed the constitutional amendment to actually create the, the program. Um, and so, yeah, it was really initiated by them. The idea being like, look, our, our country has issues with poverty, with crime, with corruption, and we're going to try to clean up the country in, in some different ways. And charter cities are this kind of, I don't know, it's, it's an alternative way. Part of the idea is that like changing all of these things, trying to remove corruption or changing a whole legal system on top of people who are already living under it, like that's kind of tricky and problematic, right? It's like, you know, changing out a code base while somebody's in the middle of using the app is like mm -hmm. people didn't sign up for some, you know, radical new change in their legal system and, and they shouldn't get it. And as far as something like corruption, when it's endemic in society, when that's what people are used to, you're like, oh, I got stopped at a traffic light. This is how it works. Or this is how I get a business license. I, you know, go down there and pay someone. It's really, really hard to remove it. And so charter cities are this brilliant policy tool that says, okay, Let's take empty land and have a different system there run by different people, by outsiders. And then it will grow, hopefully, its own bubble of a different culture. You know, hopefully a culture with more transparency and accountability and integrity. And the, the thought is that you may be able to do, um, to, to do much, much more in this kind of container that starts from scratch and, and brings people in, brings in both locals and foreigners as it grows, that that might actually be a lot easier than reforming a whole country. And, you know, from a philosophical, it's like, it's better because it's opt-in, right? And that's like, you know, that's that's how I think it should be. Um, 
as far as you know in other conversations with other countries uh you know we are we're coming in trying to be partners to governments and help them with their problems those problems include poverty because of a lack of foreign direct investment and education and that's what we want to help with so we we try to pitch this in as you know uh, as as normal terms as possible right this is a public private partnership to create a free trade zone and the kind of the exchange the trade is that you the government pass this package of legal concessions and then we bring in foreign direct investment and create jobs based on that and that's kind of the the, the bargain so it is a little weird for me right given that i started out kind of hardcore libertarian anarcho-capitalist um, you know, young and rebellious in my 20s and kind of being against governments. And now it's like, hmm. nope, actually, they are my key partners for what I'm doing right now. But, you know, that's just what happens when you grow up. Yeah. <laughs> um, realize the world is not an Ayn Rand novel. Well, there least, you go. Not completely, only partially. Yeah. And, and I always struggle with that because, uh, you know, we we can our, our philosophy and strategy is agorism. Right. And so. We're trying to carve out a free society without having to negotiate with government. But I often think like, all right, because again, it's this is like a big picture view of things and the work that you're doing is as well. It's going to take time to transform society or even to build, a, to birth a micro society. Um, and so we have this group called the Freedom Cell Network. There's like 40,000 people that are all connected. We're all working together to grow our own food, raise the kids together, trade amongst ourselves, right? And one of the things that I see is like strength in numbers. Maybe one of these days we can have enough, uh, enough people and a sheer volume of people where we all say, no, we're not going to comply together at the same time. And because there's, you know, let's say 25,000 of us in a given small area some people living on the same property, other people living close. Um, maybe that's enough for the law enforcement or the local bureaucrats to be like, we can't even manage all these people. But at the end of the day, what I'm foreseeing perhaps is we're still going to have to have a relationship with the local government and ideally a positive relationship where we're seen as good stewards of the community. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's necessary that we're going to have to make some concessions here? We're going to have to negotiate? Or do you think a bunch of free people could find one of the most free areas that's the least repressive and just slowly but surely opt out? Now, of course, we're talking about property tax and income mm. tax here. So strategically, is it necessary to go and play nice with the government? Yes, but not for any specific reasons, um, you know, related to this situation, but just because uh, you know, when you're an adult and acting in a professional manner, um, kind of having good relationships with stakeholders whenever possible is, is a good thing. And, you know, in this case, I, I do think it, it matters a lot. Um, because like, if you just think about the, the optics of the narratives here, there's a way that this stuff can be framed as anti-social rebellion, um, you know, people can, I don't know, analogize it to the Branch Davidian, say. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one way. And the more oppositional and, and screw you you are, I think the more risk of that. Or it can be an analogized to things like the founding of this amazing country, mm -hmm. you know, in the late 1700s that decided to test out a political system based on philosophy that most people said was crazy that the Europeans thought was, was completely nuts. Mm. Uh, and that worked so well that it's now the industry standard. Huh. Um, and I think that, I don't know, maybe that's not the best analogy because we had a fight with the British because that's, you know, because that was the situation, but yeah, but they still um, negotiated with the British in good faith right, to they try tried. to reach peace, a peaceful, amicable that's right. dissolution. Yeah. They, 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 they tried and, and, and tried and tried. So I don't know. I, I guess, one thing I'd encourage is is like just is to break down the problem into a lot of pieces, right? If you're like, hey, we want to create a free society within the U.S., like that's just it's 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 too big and too hard, and you can't do do metrics on it. But I'm really into this idea of like the unbundling of sovereignty, yeah. like breaking it into its constituent pieces, and then think about like which of these can we most effectively take control back over. Uh, and we live in a really interesting time for this, the whole thing where states are standing up against the federal government. I mean, if you had told me in the 90s that like 
federalism, like states would assert federalism and like <laughs> civil disobedience to the U.S. government to do drugs. Like, what the, like no way, like no way. That's like two impossible things like together. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we are we are seeing, you know, naturally as the central system grows and ages and, and does worse and is more and more out of touch, um, you know, naturally uh, decentralized things are going to are going to rise and gain power. So, yeah, I would just mm -hmm. say break it up into lots of little pieces, make friends whenever you can. Like, you know, that if, if you can get a government official to see you as a solution rather than a problem, mm -hmm. like that's that's a big win, you know, like. Um, I guess it just feels to me the same as relationship to building everywhere. Like, yeah. you know, like the police, like, look, you and I, like we share the same goal. Like we both want people to be safe and secure in their person and property, right? We're totally on board with this. Now we're going about it in different ways. You're doing this as part of this old systems and here's, and now here's these different ways that we're doing it. And we think this will work better for this reasons as opposed to like, fuck you. Yeah. It's just more, adult. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> no, you're right. I appreciate this conversation too, because this is all the kind of stuff that's constantly going through my head. And, um, you know, I used to be part, I don't know if you're familiar with the 10th Amendment Senator's guy, Michael Bolden, but uh, we put on these Nullify Now conferences in the early 2010s. Um, and, you know, back then even it was like, sure, there was cannabis. Cannabis was like the poster child for federalism regaining a foothold. But also, I was still kind of like, after I became more of an anarchist and voluntarist, I was like, yeah, that's a freaking joke. We can't rely on the 10th Amendment. But then look what happened with COVID and states bucking all the federal mandates and all these rules. So there's definitely something there. And there's a lot to be said about um, piecemeal. I always had this vision of, like, we slowly but surely decouple ourselves from as many government requirements and services as possible, and we do so in a way that is puts us at a, a, puts ourselves, our property, our homes at as little risk as possible. And then yeah. over the course of several years, maybe even longer, maybe generations, uh, we've decoupled ourselves in many ways, and it makes it easier to dissolve that relationship. But then. Like you're saying, it's a very mature look, right? Like there's all this Twitter debates and, and libertarians debating with each other. And it's like, well, it needs to be like this and the borders need to be like this and or they don't need to be like that at all. But it's like, all right, we're just philosoph philosophizing here and like debating. Yeah. How are we actually going to make this happen? What does the real world operate like? And you're right. It's adults right. coming to agreements and giving some concessions here and there. Um, yeah, this but is I do think I we got like the best opportunity kinship. now. Sorry, go ahead. This is why I feel more kinship with like with, with you guys, e even though you're working within the bounds of the United States, than people say who want new societies but are coming from an entirely like philosophical and theoretical place, right? It's all about actually building things, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and and you guys exem exemplify that, so it's part of why I'm here. Right on, right on. Yeah, and we appreciate having you, and I think you got some really solid insights to work with. Um, Let's talk more about doing it in the United States or Texas, All right? Because we're here in Texas, and we've talked about you know special economic zones amongst ourselves and stuff. We're not obviously not putting anything forward to the legislature legislators, but the challenge with, of course, our area is you got Texas, and then you got the federal government, which you know holds most of the cards. Unfortunately, what are some ideal characteristics of a state? that make it optimal for experimenting with charter cities, free private cities? Do, do the state have to be somewhat failing? Um, can we mm. do this? What, what would it even look like in the U.S.? What, as you said, like what yeah. little piecemeal things could we do? So, so part of how I look at this and the reason that I don't work in the U.S. is I just think about like what percentage of the laws and regulations that apply to um, a city is this city getting to write itself and you know in the US if you have you can just think if you have city level autonomy like you control the municipality county state you can think about how much you get and at the state level uh, about two-thirds of the spending is still federal and I would argue that in a business friendly state the vast like way higher percentage than that of the laws and regulations are federal because we have competition between the states and so things work better at that level, but the majority of government is, is at the federal level. And so the program in Honduras, for example, um, we have to follow their constitution and their treaties. 
as well as their criminal law. But the, the constitutional amendment there gives the zone operators, once they're approved of by the government regulator, pr pretty wide authority to write all commercial reg regulations, which is with the vast majority of regulations that apply kind of in practice, you know, anything that's not a crime, basically. And so it's a really, really high percentage. And because that exists, you know, and that's kind of the axis I care about, that's what I work on. Now, if you go look back in the U.S., you know, it's not like you're at a zero on that axis, right? At, at each level, there is some percentage of laws that you get to write. Um, and at the state level, you know, it. I think it is, it is significant, even if it's a lot less than you can get overseas, just because of the structure of the, of, you know, the U.S. Constitution and how things have evolved over time and the Civil War and all that. Like the federal government just has really strong power. So, you know, in general, I find working with like smaller polities to be much easier. So in the U.S., um, you know, whether that's Montana, Wyoming, New Hampshire, uh, places like mm -hmm. that. There, there's definitely, I, I feel like in some places, huge like Texas, like it's harder to work with and you're able to influence the course of it less. Mm. But at the same time, it has so much more weight and power. Like when Texas does choose to stand up for itself, as we're seeing about this immigration stuff lately, it has a lot of power and resources to do so. But realistically, you're just not going to be able to influence it very much. The, the project in the U.S. that has the most autonomy is the Catawba Digital SEZ in North Carolina. Um, and there they're, they're working in partnership with a Native American tribe. Mm. And they have actually higher level of autonomy than a U.S. state. Uh, my impression is still quite a bit less than the federal government, but, you know, somewhat above a state. You know, but even there, I'd, I'd say it's it's less than... On the percentage of right, like well, way less than half the regulations that you're getting to write. It's still like a small minority because there's just so much uh, of that crap at the federal level. Right on. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, and part of the reason we encourage people to get out of the cities, out in the country, is because there's a lot, there's a lot of regulations and stuff that simply aren't enforced. And I don't want to throw myself under the bus or anything, but you know, when it comes to having people on your property with a little RV pad. Um, may or may not be kosher in certain rural jurisdictions without checking this box or they got to be your family, this, that, or the other. But if you're cozy with your neighbors, you're very much left alone, you know. But the ideal, I'd love it someday if we didn't have to pay the damn property tax. That would be nice. Um, and, of course, the income tax. Income tax seems easier to avoid in large part or at least minimize your tax burden than the property tax. That's a pretty serious one that we have to deal with in, in many states in the U.S., uh, let's talk about uh, the idea of a network state because that comes into play too. And one of the things that we're trying to do with the Freedom Cell Network is like there's little pockets of communities and then we all connect together and trade amongst ourselves and have common rules uh, that we agree to go by. But um, how would you define a network state and can you talk about the role that that's playing in this whole body of work as well? Sure. Um, so Balaji's idea of a network state, it's by analogy with the nation state. So nation comes from the same root as NATO. It's, it's a state, a government of people that were born together in one geographic area. And in network state, the idea is that a set of people who have shared values could align themselves in a tribe that starts out as a virtual tribe and then over time uh, meets physically and takes on some of the kind of prerogatives of sovereignty. Perhaps it would be able to issue travel documents, um, provide other services to its citizens, and eventually, as one part of what it does, form a charter city. But you know, the idea includes having kind of a, a common crypto network and internal economy, just like you're describing, uh, as, as for the same reasons, because um, you know, when you're transacting with yourself, it's a lot harder for with your own group of people, with your own tribe, a higher trust environment and it's a lot harder for an outside authority to tell you what the rules are and you know the other thing about the network state you know the book is great it's free online is that it's it's the idea i just described but it's also just a, a package of all of Balaji's like kind of amazing hilarious wonderful like crazy ideas about how the world works which are just like well worth exposing yourself to there's there, there's a lot of them and so it's, it's, it's kind of this whole like different way of thinking about history in the future with, 
you know, just like a crazy rate of amazing insights, hmm. kind of all centered around this idea of organizing ourselves like in a digitally native way for the 21st century. Awesome. Yeah, things are definitely changing and in, in the centralized, it's, it's, obviously we're trying to like accelerate this or show people there's another way, but these centralized systems are just failing of their own accord because they're built on fraud and terrible economics. And I guess everybody just has to comply in order for it to work, but even then it doesn't work. And then people comply less because it doesn't work and they're like losing their asses off and it's harder to get by. So um, I think the time is now for these types of experiments. Let's talk about uh, pronomos. Am I saying that right? Pronomos, pronomos, pronomos? pronomos what does that word yes. mean? Is that a conglomeration of words? Is it a Spanish word? What is pronomos? Yeah, pronomos so, capital. So, nomos is the Greek word for law. Um, and it actually, it started out meaning custom. And the word for custom became the word for law because they saw law is being formed in this bottom-up way by people trying out different customs and a custom that lasted long enough being enshrined in a law uh and it's yeah so i i'm a big fan of those of these ancient greek words and and of that that part of human history and then Excellent. pro just meaning either like good or towards or okay both. cool so like so towards good law Let's go. Um, and this is like an investment fund. People are pulling resources together in order to make these ideas a reality. You want to break mm -hmm. down what that looks like? And I see you guys have a portfolio of projects you're already working on here. I, if, I don't know if you could see my screen there. Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Yeah, tell us about some of these projects and more about Pronomos. Sure, yeah. So Pronomos is the first investment fund focusing on cities that write their own laws, uh, as we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, because I think because there aren't very many good ideas about how to make government work way better, uh, we've been able to attract a really amazing set of investors. Um, Peter Thiel is the main investor. We've got Mark Andreessen, Balaji, Naval Ravikant, Joe Lonsdale, um, from the crypto world, people like Brock Pierce, Roger Baer. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing set of people, definitely a lot of uh a lot of crypto people in there because there's there's a really strong overlap between these these concepts right of replacing things traditionally done by a legacy state with like private decentralized alternatives and so what we do is we work with founders and countries to create these uh these projects and programs now you know i'll be honest like We've gone from zero to one with Honduras Prospera, which is the first one listed there on that page. So it's been operating for about four years. I started working with Honduras back in 2011. Um, turned out to be too early. They changed their constitution, but they hadn't allocated any budget yet. It was like nights and weekends work for the for the government officials. Mm -hmm. And we realized it wasn't going to happen soon. So we quit after a year. Uh, but they've actually been operating. I mean, I've been there three times in the past four or five months uh, getting medical treatments. So Wow. Um, in November, I got this gene therapy called Follistatin that made my like cardio, I'd say like, I don't know, two thirds better. Like I was, I was like from a week after I was running like more than, more than 50% more like miles, like every, like just starting like one day a week later, like immediately, not like a training effect. Wow. Um, that one's really neat. The, for those who follow longevity, Brian Johnson got it. And then I was there with him this year. Uh, he was bringing his dad to get the same treatment. Uh, and then this year I've had, I've had two things. I, I had my mouth bacteria replaced uh, with a different oral microbiome of bacteria that instead of making lactic acid, they make ethanol, which is, which is kind of funny. But the idea is without lactic acid dissolving your teeth, there's no cavities. Like, cavities only happen because there's an acid in there. <laughs> and, you know, the ethanol that this strain of bacteria makes, it's, you know, such a tiny amount that it doesn't, you know, you're not like constantly drunk or anything. It's just funny. Um, <laughs> and they're hoping to actually launch it in the in the US. They're on as, as a cosmetic procedure, they're still working on that. But for now, it's, uh, these are available only in Prospera. And then when I was there a few weeks ago, I got a, uh, I got a chip put in my hand. Oh boy. It's like, it's like right, like <laughs> right here. Um, it unlocks my Tesla 
and oh, people can goodness. bump to get my business card. And there's it, it does crypto too. I can set up like PGP signatures. I haven't I haven't done that yet. So um, yeah, there's a really cool group of human augmentation uh, people, a company like biohackers basically who have moved to Prospera, set up their their labs. Um, you know, they've in, inside an office. They've got like a, a a surgery clean room, like sterile for doing the procedures, and they've got like an electronics clean room. Hmm. Each set up as like a room inside a bigger room. It's really cool. So a lot of medical stuff happening because, of course, Prospera. You know, unless it's something that's a that's a crime, like for example, psychedelic drugs would be a crime. But for something that's like a medical procedure, Prospera they write their medical regulations just like they write their labor law, zoning law, you know, securities law, family law, contract law, tort law, like it's it's almost everything is is commercial law. So that's super exciting. You know, it's kind of our, our zero to one moment. It's out there operating. They're about to open their first. It's you know, it's relatively small. They've got uh, something like close to a thousand acres, but it's it's not very built out. There's a, a Bitcoin cafe, a Montessori school, nice. um, a small number of things. Mainly, it's it's a hotel resort, uh, which has been great for doing conferences and getting people out there. But they're about to open their first multifamily tower with 90 apartments, and I think that's going to be a, a a big big difference because there's a you know a bunch of people now like as of this year for the first time there's a significant group staying there permanently like. I don't know, say 40 or 50 people. Um, you know, before this, it was mostly mostly transients, people coming through conferences and stuff because there was no housing on site. And of course, Hondurans working at the businesses within the zone, but not living there. So they're uh, they're they're now finally a permanent residence, and this medical thing is happening. So Prosper is really booming. And then we're working with countries and founders around the world to try to make more of these. Um, actually, a company that that is not in our portfolio. Um, Threefold got law passed in Zanzibar recently, which might be the, I haven't looked into it in detail, but it might be like the second law after Honduras to enable these kinds of charter cities. And then, um, you know, our company Praxis working with several countries around the Mediterranean. Um, uh, our company Alpha Cities is working with several countries in Africa. And yeah, that's just, that's, that's what we do. We, uh, we work around the world trying to make more of these programs. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me ask you about about the chip, right? Because a big chunk of our audience, you know, we're libertarian, uh, voluntarist, but there's a lot of foundation in the whole conspiratorial world. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so let me ask That's you. Right. So I like to troll all sides. I'm <laughs> all sides. Troller. <laughs> Come on. So there's a lot of nuance, right? So I'm into crypto, and some of my associates are into Bitcoin, Monero, and there's a lot of people that think Bitcoin is the new world order and SHA-256 was the NSA and blah, blah, blah. And, and oftentimes they're just totally full of it and they just read an article online. But there's this nuance between technology and then, you know, human beings wanting to leverage technology want to, for convenience, for being able to advance their company or whatever, analysis, data. These are all good things, right? But then there's also obviously you know more sinister effort to leverage technology in order to surveil and control led by the world economic forum and this fourth industrial revolution and there's a lot of ugliness there so you know what do you have to say about the nuance because you know there's an effort and there's desires to have a cashless society cbdc force a chip in everybody's hand you went and volunteered the chip um i don't imagine you're being surveilled through the chip but what do you think about all this nuance between same thing with smart cities. I imagine some of the projects that are going to work on are going to leverage some smart city technology. Maybe it's a private company organizing it. What do you have to let me know if anything came up through all this? Because a lot of people are going to be like a chip in his hand. What the heck's up with uh, that? Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I love that you're bringing up nuance. There's there's a lot of it in every important issue, and our minds are not very good at grappling with it. Um, I I don't believe I'm being spied on through this chip because it only works at very, very close range. In fact, I'm only to, for people to scan the business card, I have to have them like take the the case off and it, it only works about half the time. Um, the guys who put it in says that as the swelling goes down, maybe that will be more reliable, but this is a technology that only works like up very, very close. Uh, but it's true that, you know, technology gives us, you know, ways like, uh, like Zcash or Monero to transact uh, privately, things like encryption to send messages privately, and 
It means that that state actors and large companies or whoever can amass, you know, huge piles of data about us and search it very efficiently. Like overall, I think that technology is much more of an anti-privacy tool. Like there, there are really important ways like messaging and money that it gives us extreme levels of security. But overall, I think it's, you know, it's much better for monitoring. And, you know, to me, I guess I, I come at this stuff from a very, very like pragmatic angle. It's like, okay, this is the world. Like, what do we do with it? Um, and yeah, I guess I see, I think maybe it's tough for me because I've like all, never been a very private person. I've always been very like open TMI, like, hmm. you know, blogging about stuff that, um, you know, when my dad's like, how, why do you write this stuff? Like, how do you, <laughs> you just like share these kinds of things with people? Hmm. You know, that's just, that's just me. Um, I think privacy is an important tool, but just in general, like I think that 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 being effective comes from accepting reality and being like, okay, here are the way, here there are certain ways that I can secure my privacy in 2024, and if I value them, I'll do it. And at the same time, accept that there's other ways in which you can't, like because of the massive amount of surveillance technology that's out there, and just like accept it and and build the best life you can like given that for me i wouldn't have gotten this chip in my hand if it weren't for like being able to put my business card on it and be like a walking advertise like here's a procedure that i got like <laughs> only in this jurisdiction that i helped form you know i wasn't like hey i want a chip you know it's more like it was my third trip i got really cool i got the the follow statin to make me faster I got the no cavities mouth treatment and I was there a few weeks ago and I was like, I don't have any amazing treatment lined up. Let me like see what else there is here oh that I can God. get. And I was like, look, I'm the Charter City investor. If I can give people my business card by having them tap on this chip that was implanted only there, like there it go. makes it so real. It's like real and visceral to them. They can see like this little like, you know, where where the um, th this glass enclosed um, Vivo flex key like like is and so to me that that in the fact that some people like love it and some people hate it is like even better because then it's more emotionally <laughs> salient so just being like a walking advertisement for this jurisdiction and the way that trolls people i mean that's my idea of a good time um if people don't want to put chips in themselves that makes a lot of sense to me <laughs> you know yeah. i don't think that we should be forcing anyone to do it and and i get it's creepy and yeah Look, it's 2024. I'm a troll. You can't, there, yeah. can't do it in this world without being a troll these days. That's right. You'll lose your mind. I got to say, that's commitment there to the to the cause and to this fund you put together to go uh, to do that and, and as like kind of like a marketing thing. And I'm sure, you, you know, you, you seem to like it and benefits you. You know, um, I'm, I want they're making LEDs that they can implant under the skin, like oh glowing goodness. lights. That's what I really want from them. I'm working with them on a, on a design for an implantable lights i'm excited that's a true you know i get um so you said you uh, we have a tesla in fact i get a lot of flack for driving a tesla from our conspiracy community it's a solid por portion of our base in fact probably a significant people in our audience are like they came from it through conspiracy that's how i came from it 20 years ago 2002 i guess that's 21 22 years ago uh, about well, i watched the 9 11 documentary but as i got older i started to realize that not everything is a conspiracy and then i was introduced to ron paul and murray rothbard and went down the whole libertarian austrian economics and i realized like a lot of this you know 99 percent of what I thought was a New World Order conspiracy, maybe 95% or 90%, is uh, actually greed and people trying to position themselves in a place of power because of their ego and insecurity. Uh, there most definitely is a conspiracy at play yeah. and a lot of deception and social engineering. But one thing I realized recently, people lost their minds when we shared that we bought a second Tesla because I'm a huge fan. They're awesome cars. Like, oh, my God. Once I – it was my wife that wanted to get one, and I was like, eh, I don't know. They're kind of expensive. I'm not really – electric car, what? And then when we test drove it, it was a Model 3 performance, and we test drove it, and I was like – that was all it took, pressing on the gas and not having to feel the gears change. I was like, this is awesome. Anyway, caught a lot of flack, um, but I realized I recently, we finally got to tour the, um, the Gigafactory here. It's like literally right down the road. We live in, in Bastrop County, 
And I brought my kids because they're all excited and Elon inspires them. Elon's another nuanced character, right? He's awesome, but he also is cozy with the Department of Defense and spy satellites and stuff. Uh, but he inspires the piss out of me and what he's managed to accomplish. Anyway, I realized that there's a lot of conspiracy theorists and like that's their identity. And we give meaning to the world around us based on the identity that we give to ourselves because we can choose what how we identify. Right, like with the gender stuff, yeah. right? You're, you're identifying as it's all a psyop. Um, and I realized like if somebody's identity is conspiracy theorist, it's not the most beneficial to society identity to have because then all you just see is conspiracy all around you. And even though there is a conspiracy, you got to step into an identity of a creator, a builder, an innovator, an entrepreneur, a farmer, whatever it is, we got to do something. And if all we see is conspiracy everywhere and we're nitpicking every little thing and this association and we put these things together and John, you drive a Tesla, you're a fool, you know, that doesn't really serve us. What serves us is, yeah, there's corruption, the government's harming us, and there is a conspiracy. Now, what are we going to do about it? That's the identity that interests me. And so I think there's some of my, in my audience that would be all up in arms about me driving a Tesla or you having a chip in your arm. But at the same time, it's like, well, we're actually out there building shit in this world and trying to drive the ball down the field towards greater freedom. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, there's so much, so much to say there. I mean, one thing I'll say is I think that there are a few explicit conspiracies and like a ton of implicit conspiracies, like everyone involved in the, the cathedral, like the government, Ivy League, you know, New York Times, like creature, like they all share an interest in promoting the legitimacy of that creature and like lying about bad things that it's done, lying about how well it works, like covering up its mistakes, exaggerating, like that's a lot of people. That's like a millions of maybe like tens of millions of people who like all share an interest in like deceiving the rest of us about how things work in an important way. Like there are huge implicit conspiracies, um, you know, and there's some explicit conspiracies. I, I don't think there's a ton. I really agree with you on this identity thing is like, I mean, Paul Graham has an, an amazing essay, like just an identity. And I come at this from a Buddhist perspective as well. Like just identity. It's like it constrains you to a small set of ways of looking at the world. Mm. And the, the, the mature adult effective thing is to learn a whole toolkit of ways of looking, a bunch of different models and paradigms, because none of them is the absolute truth. Mm. None of them covers all situations. Like, I mean, we, we do have the laws of physics, but, you know, mm. going to more complicated things like like human society, um, you know, and life. Like there's no simple fundamental set of laws like that. And the way to be wise and, and to understand things is to have a great toolkit of models and a lot of experience about which ones to apply in which situations. So any identity that you have um, is kind of cutting off a lot of tools in your toolkit, right? And, and you can also think in terms of there being like axes, like where there's a right amount of worrying about conspiracy. There's a right amount of paranoia. Right. And this is true for like almost all characteristics. Like if you worry about if you're like have too low paranoia and you just trust everything the government says and you like eat according to the food pyramid and like think the Social <laughs> Security is going to like pay for your time. All right. Like you're pretty screwed. Like that's real bad. You know, at the same time, if you're so I don't know if you're so paranoid that you refuse to, you refuse to interact with anyone at all because you don't trust them. Um, or that, you know, you'll only eat food that you made yourself and you'll only live in a house that you built yourself. Like there, th there's ways where like, uh, you can be doubting too much, doubting when, when it's not accurate, um, or, or when it's not helpful. And like, yeah, we want to find the right point. And then, um, I thought it was really important that you talked about like building and, and like, so there's our identities constrain us, but also they can be part of our toolbox, thinking of ourselves in certain ways. And, you know, it, what I got out of what you said is that you have to be really careful with like negative, you know, like I am against this or like I generally like distrust large things. Like, I don't know, that's like a great like principle, but to me, it's not like a, a worldview or, 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 or a paradigm. Uh, whereas like I am a builder, like when I see problems in the world, like, obviously, I can't work on everything. In fact, I can only work on like a teeny, teeny, tiny, small percentage of things. But like, rather than focusing my attention on noticing and complaining about what's wrong, I'm going to use the fact that I notice and I'm bothered by so many things that are wrong to pick 
the the one you know or or, or a few where uh, I can make real change where I can build something better uh, maybe that just serves me maybe it serves my family or my community or in the best case that could even serve humanity and that I focus the majority of my attention on what can I build to make this better and not what's wrong and I think that that's just it's 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 critical in so many ways it's critical for mental health and it's critical for changing the world and like it's not that we it's not that we don't need observation and complaining of problems like those are the first step mm -hmm. but then we need to actually take action on them and this is like what's different about my whole approach to, to politics and political philosophy is i is is i'm all about and like look we don't need new ideas for laws we don't need new ideas for legal systems we don't need new ideas for social systems we're drowning in them because nobody ever gets to try them like mm -hmm. there's no way to actually build those societies and put it in practice so you know i'm just just really really obsessed with like dragging this idea of living together in new ways and organizing new ways from something that people complain about because it's so freaking hard like it's really understandable that it's you know you, you debate philosophy in a, in a bar because it's so hard but like how can we bring it into the real world and make it so that we can actually build these societies and see what it works like in practice because it may not work out if something that i think is great you know maybe terrible something looks good on paper might not work at all like like the only way to find out is by building it I love it and experimenting. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but at least we gave it a shot. Um, and another thing too, people in my camp uh, sometimes lack the big picture thinking, which which I'm obsessed with because part of my identity, one of my main identities, is an entrepreneur. So I study successful entrepreneurs. Uh, study Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. Um, of course, Steve Jobs is a wonderful person to study. He's really done a whole lot to ding the universe, as he said. Um, but it's like the cool thing that y'all are doing is because con contrasting with our X and a build thing, we're like, leave the cities. They're going to hell. They're controlled and they're going to be totally surveilled and move out to the country and let's form these little pockets. And it can be big by connecting the pockets because I want there to be big, like big picture. We have leverage. We have influence. There's a bunch of us. We're connected. We're supporting each other. But there's a lot of people too that that resist the big picture thinking and think that it's all if it's going to be big just like if, if anyone ever reaches the mm -hmm. status of a billionaire then they must be corrupt and controlled and part of the new world order or they never would have been able to do it and i'm a big fan mm -hmm. of grant cardone so he always comes to mind he's like he's a billionaire and that guy goes rails against the system and the vaccine and he's obviously he tells us his whole story um anyway so the cool thing i think what y'all are doing it, it, real quick the thing i want to share is like a lot of people in our community they seed areas of society or tools like you shared so they're like bitcoin it can be controlled or black rocks now investing in bitcoin and they're like we got we got to just give that to the new world order so to speak mm -hmm. but i'm like no man we could influence this cryptocurrency space we could leverage this tool why would we just give blockchain away that's more specific they're creating blockchain yeah. digital identity and tracking and surveilling therefore blockchain is bad it's like no we can create cool stuff with blockchain mm -hmm. too just the same matt mckibben you familiar with matt mckibben he goes, he goes to World Economic Forum in Davos every year to try to influence them. It's not like we're the right. victims. They're going to control everything. He's like, no, I want to influence them about psychedelics and cryptocurrency. They're very powerful people. Let me get my opinion in. And then just the same with what you're doing. We don't have to just give up the idea of a city because there's a lot of awesome stuff, culture, innovation, uh, business development that comes from cities. And so it's not that we have to just exit the cities and move to the country and that's it. We just live on small little eco villages. You're like, no, let's build our own cities that are based on principles and values that we identify with. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I think the cities are the greatest uh, economic engine that, that we have, cities and capitalism. And I don't want to give up on them. Um, I do think like, like, I don't know, it's, 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 you know, I'm hearing you describe a lot of black and white thinking and, and it's tough. Like, I don't know what the answer is, but like all of these things are really just about nuance. Like the strategy of uh, moving to a rural area and being more self-sufficient has its pros and cons. Look, before I moved to Texas last year, so I spent 30 years in California. I moved to Austin, Texas last summer. I spent my last five years in California living up in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, you know, at, at, at 2000 feet overlooking the Pacific. Cool. you know with with a generator because the power would go out 40 times a year well water septic 
Um, you know, and there were some things that were that were great. They were great about that. Uh, and there were some things that sucked, right? Like like these things are trade-offs. And so I think it's, it's again, it's like a, a way of looking, like a tool in our toolbox of, hey, when we control the physical space, like geographically, when we have like empty land around us that we own, and we have like neighbors and communities that control all of the land, uh, when we have our own infrastructure, like we have more control over it and, and we can protect our privacy and, and our health. And that's like absolutely true. And you're losing economies of scale and that generally makes everything more expensive and that's a downside. And we just need to look at everything in terms of these like these trade offs, these these pros and cons. And I agree with you, like we should not, you know, seed all economies of scale to the state like hell no, just like we should not seed like blockchain to the state, right? Like they're going to make their uses out of it because it's a technology, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that we can't make our uses out of it. And I don't know, with psychedelics, like it's a tool, but like a tool that changes the user. I mean, crypto might be like this too. So like, sure, uh, a, like a central bank can adopt crypto or you know, government officials can say we have a mental health problem and it'll save money for our society if we have better mental health tools. Let's, you know, let's let's legalize psychedelics. But like, those things change the people who do them. Mm -hmm. They change the societies that they're in. And like, I don't know. I think some of the most powerful change comes from there's like, I don't know. Most like there's like exit voice and maybe there's like, like. Uh, I don't know, like ninja mind control Jedi, right? There's like, let's <laughs> leave and do our own thing. There's like, let's participate within the institution's feedback mechanisms, which, you know, I, I think doesn't work very well, but it's, it's, it's an option. And there's like, let's subvert the system. Let's like change it by like deep understanding of how it works and deep understanding of the world. Let's find ways to, to change it, um, you know, without it even knowing. I don't know. I think I don't know that I have great examples for that other than psychedelics, but that one seems clear. Yeah. Well, getting people to understand, you know, debt based money is another example, which often comes from from Bitcoin and crypto. It's it's kind of like a Trojan horse. You learn about it and then you realize, like, wow, this whole system's a fraud. And that's kind of like a psychedelic experience. Like I'm viewing the world differently than I ever did. But yeah, psychedelics, I think like a fundamental thing is like we live in a trauma based society. And in order to overcome trauma in systems that are inherent with trauma, whether it's repressive police or just people not having any power to make decisions about their own lives, um, it's going to take like really having a spiritual awakening as well, which is cool that it's part of this whole big movement of people. There's like a consciousness shift, which I think is ultimately really necessary or else we'll just – we could create a free city or whatever, but if everybody's still all traumatized, then there's still going to be this corruption and this harm that we inflict upon each other. But if we're all doing the work while, you know, doing the transformational work while doing the practical work, then I think that's the ultimate. Mm. That's the way. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, do you have any parting words or any uh, any websites or any events you want to share? Of course, uh, Patrick's going to be speaking at the Exxon Build Land Summit May 16th through the 20th. The formal conference is 17th, 18th, and 19th. On the 16th and 20th, we're going to be going out into Central Texas, visiting farms and little communities. But uh, what anything coming up in your world? Do you want to share some links with folks? Yeah, I'll just say that I'm really excited to be here in Austin because I feel like this combination that you just described of like people who are upgrading their consciousness and healing, but also really into freedom and independence. To me, that's kind of like the, I don't know, the near Austin vibe, right? Like Austin yeah. brings the, uh, the, the spirituality and consciousness and, you know, Texas uh, brings the independence and freedom. So I'm psyched for that. Uh, yeah, follow me online. I, I mostly use Twitter at Patricimo. It's my first name, Patri, P-A-T-R-I, and then S as in Sam, S as in Sam, I-M-O. Uh, also, Pronomos VC is the uh, is the the fun Twitter, and from there you can get links to uh, everything else. Events now. I mean, I just I just we just finished this whole series of events in Prospera. There was a couple hundred people there in uh, January and February, and you know, forty or fifty of them have stayed on. But at this point, other than uh, catching the the eclipse coming up, um, uh, you know. DM me if you'll be in Austin uh, around the eclipse. And other than that, 
nothing to announce event wise right now okay cool all right thanks so much for spending some time with us i appreciate what you're doing and, and looking forward to connecting at the event at the land summit awesome yeah thanks for having me look forward to meeting you and your community awesome all right take care all right, ladies and gents, uh, this has been Live Free Now, bringing you the news, views, tips, and tools you can use to live a free and prosperous life. And uh, hope that you'll join us at the Exit and Build Land Summit. We'll be launching the virtual tickets soon, as well as the free sign-up. You get the first day and a half for free. Anyone can sign up to register for that. But the best way to experience the event is to connect in person. There's farm tours on the first and fifth day. And then at lunch each day, we'll have farm-to-table meals sourced from the very farms that you'll be visiting on day one and day five, which is pretty cool. So you can learn more about that at ExitAndBuildLandSummit.com. ExitAndBuildLandSummit.com. As always, friends, stay free out there.